Well, we are going to take another look at the whole question of vaccine passports today on this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. So we've reached out to Blake Murdoch. He's a senior research associate at the University of Alberta's Health Law Institute. So his research looks at health and law and the intersection of those two issues, policy, bioethics, informed consent, alternative medicine, all of these issues. And more recently, you might have uh, read his article on vaccine passports and concerns about misleading information about vaccination, particularly, of course, online. So he's got a doctor of laws, he's got an MBA and a degree in political science and government, all from the University of Alberta. And he uh, joins us this today from Edmonton. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Murdoch. Are you a doctor, a professor, or what should I call you? I'm not a member of faculty. No, I'm I'm, uh, just one of these lowly lawyers who's gone into academia and trying to (laughs) to make a difference there. So that is an interesting decision, isn't it? Professionally? (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've, I've always loved the content of law, but I prefer to be sort of uh, fighting for what I think is correct rather than sort of being for hire. So that's that's sort of how I uh, do things. Of course, there's other ways to do that in law, but I've been happy yeah. with uh, working at the Health Law Institute. Well, let's tackle this uh, issue because it's one for all governments, uh, domestically, foreign, everywhere. We're going to have to wrestle this issue of of a vaccine passport. I'm not sure that's exactly the right word, but it's the shorthand because when you talk about a passport, you kind of think about travel and going somewhere else, but this is also an issue uh, domestically. So um, where do you, where do you start in this discussion? Yeah, I think you, you made a very good point. It's important to distinguish between international and domestic uh, vaccine passports and some of the language, you know, uh, academically shifting to vaccine certificates for sort of the yeah. use uh, domestically. And so international vaccine passports are fairly inevitable for obvious reasons uh, around different countries, not wanting to let people who aren't citizens in uh, unless they've got certain protections. Uh, domestic vaccine passports are the more controversial issue and the issue uh, that I was sort of mostly focusing on when I wrote uh, my recent piece there. Yeah, because I mean, we're already seeing it. You can, you know, go to a football game in Saskatchewan, but you can't in uh, Manitoba. And, you know, whether it's going to, you know, a Bruce Springsteen concert or the Calgary Stampede, like these How are we going to make this distinction without creating um, a a class system or or a caste system, I think even worse, of people who are vaccinated and people who aren't, uh, even though many in that latter category may have immunity uh, because they've had the disease itself? How how are we going to do that? Yeah, so it, it's it's a complicated question, but what I've said before in relation to the two tier society uh, question is that I do sort of reject that notion generally. Of course, there are individuals, some individuals who can't uh, be vaccinated or right. uh, you know certainly aren't eligible yet, and, uh, like children who need to be accommodated, of course, uh, under human rights law. And of course, age is a protected for example, protected grounds for discrimination under the charter. The choice to get vaccinated if it, there's not a legitimate, you know, like uh, vaccine contraindicating reason, uh, if there's no legitimate reason to not get vaccinated, that's not necessarily something that's protected by law. So there, there is also the option for individuals who are sort of, uh, you know, not using the vaccine passport because they don't want to be vaccinated to choose to get vaccinated. So there's, it's not like people are stuck in this class or anything like that. So I wouldn't call it a case system. On top of that, I would I would just say that um, you, you have to look at, you know, what's the trade-off of not doing this? And so that's something I've mentioned before. So that's another mm-hmm. topic, but uh, you know, this is all, you know, this isn't stuff that we would do in normal times, obviously. And so we need to look, what's the public health need for this? Because it's, it's about public health. It's not only about, you know, increasing vaccination rates or anything like that. We don't really know the numbers here, or at least I don't, but um, some of the indications stateside in the U.S., for example, is that it's two-thirds vaccinated and, and a third of the population that haven't responded either because they're vaccine hesitant or they 
will not get vaccinated or they already have immunity or they have a health condition. Like that's the large category. It's not just, uh, and I'm assuming the numbers will be roughly the same here. Um, maybe right. a little bit more take up on the vaccine. So there is. it's not yeah. something where we can just say, oh, well, you know, if you don't get it, you, you can't participate in society. No, I, I wouldn't say that. And and just to be clear, um, the scientific uh, or the, the medical recommendations are that people who have contracted COVID should still get at least one dose of vaccine. And there have been you know studies showing that that can increase their antibodies by a hundred times and things like that. So so it's important to know that uh, if you've had it, you should still get vaccinated, as it will likely provide a lot of additional protection. Uh, and then of course with variants, there's the possibility of being reinfected uh, if you don't. If you don't, um, you know, if, if you haven't had that variant yet. So, well, so, we also uh, know that people who have been vaccinated can also get COVID and, and infect others. Like, it, certainly, it's, really, it's possible. I just wouldn't equate them on a statistical level because that, they're very different. And also, the cases of rare disease are, are lower. Um, so, you know, that's something where there's more research ongoing, of course, uh, yeah. and we'll know more about, you know, how people who have had it are responding to future variants and things like that as we go. And so it's always, you know, through the pandemic, it's been very difficult to sort of evolve as the science comes out and always needing to sort of adjust to that. And that's something that, you know, hopefully we're getting more used to as a society, but it is certainly <laughs> difficult. Um, well, and, I, oh, so I, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. I was going to say to address your point about you know, certainly just excluding a third of the population. I think uh, it's important to, to think about how we would apply these vaccine pass, uh, passports or certificates, right? Um, you know, you can't apply them to essential services like the ability to go buy groceries without providing at least an alternative means of access. So the, the primary uses are, are for uh, non-essential services where there's large group settings, right? So concerts, mm -hmm. stadiums, gyms where people are, uh, you know, are, are breathing heavily and, and there's evidence that they can cause super spreader events, uh, things like that. So, you know, um, but what about going to see your mom and dad at the old folks home or grandma, you know, that's, uh, that's a very personal thing. I mean, it, it may seem uh, optional, but I don't think family's optional. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's the first need is to protect the individuals that live in, in, in that area, in that, that home. So yeah. I'll give an example. My grandfather died of COVID last year and I didn't get to see him. And so, you know, if he were still alive and living in that, in that home, I certainly would not want unvaccinated people going in to see him. Uh, even if he had been vaccinated um, since, you know, he was late in his life and, and, you uh -huh. know, the vaccine is powerful, but it, there is some reduction in immunity amongst the, amongst the older folks. So I, th I think this is where we're getting into and we're watching it unfold in the States and uh, which is, you know, everybody was told that if they vaxxed up and got their two shots, you know, you had freedom, you could take the mask off, you could visit your family. Um, and, and now that's being pulled back yet again, uh, with yeah. mask mandates. And, and I, we're kind of at that point. I was talking to a, an older friend this morning, I mean, well into, actually she's in her nineties. And she just, she just said like, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do this. And this is a very compliant woman who, you know, got her shots and stayed indoors for her two weeks after, you know, did the whole thing. But we're kind of at that point in, our country and elsewhere where people are going, hold on, when do we decide that this is something we have to live with? Right. I think that this sort of relates to vaccine passports, but it's not necessarily all about vaccine yeah. passports. It's, it's about the point at which society says everyone's had the opportunity to get vaccinated. So now the choice you know, the, the ability to um, be protected is up to you and we're not going to, you know, force public health measures anymore. And my view on that, as someone who has an eight month or an eight month old baby, right, yeah. um, uh, is that until like the entire population, especially children have the opportunity to get vaccinated, I think it's, it's irresponsible to uh, not have public health measures, uh, even though children are less 
likely to, to, to die from COVID. Uh, you know, there are a lot of potential long-term health effects and of course evolving understanding of even the new variants. So um, my view is, is that sort of time to sort of come to a point where we're talking about personal responsibility uh, and that sort of decision is not yet. Okay, and then personal responsibility versus personal choice. Right. I mean, some like countries are, are going to yeah are going to go down the, the vaccine mandate path. Um, you know, my unfortunately, what's happened is there's an infodemic of, of misinformation on the internet, and um, we have had some great success in reducing. Uh, vaccine hesitancy in Canada, right? It's come down yeah. significantly according to Angus Reid poll. So that's that's a really positive thing. On the other hand, in Alberta, for example, where I live, it's 22% recently uh, said they wouldn't seek it out if it was offered to them. So it's actually gone up from the previous poll. Uh, so there's some sign mm -hmm. that there might be some increases in some part, parts of the country of hesitancy. But, but the problem with sort opening up right now is the Delta variant. Ult ultimately, if uh, the problem is, is we were promised sort of that everything would be good if we got to seventy percent vaccinated, based on right. the estimates of the initial virus. And now Delta has put a huge wrench into things, and everyone, no one's happy about it. Everyone's very upset about it. But um, it's it's not possible to have seventy percent of the population vaccinated and have a concert, for example, with fifteen to twenty thousand people. And not have a super spreader event if 30 percent of those people are are, are uh, unvaccinated i mean not to avoid them i mean like not necessarily every case would have a super spreader event but that would lead to mm -hmm. them right so well and again as you say the the information keeps changing because we're told even by the the pharmaceutical companies themselves that the current vaccines are good against delta um but then you get all of these other bits of evidence, which is people can still get COVID. They can still transmit COVID. You know, we're operating. Yes. I know the one of the the decision in the U.S. seemed to be based on a, a study from India that that was about a vaccine that is not used in North America. So it's kind of irrelevant for our discussions. Like it's really hard to pin down what the science actually is. Yeah, well, the science is very strong for the, the reduction of severe disease uh, mm -hmm. and death for vaccination. So in that sense, it is very much individually protecting. So that's a very positive thing. The As we discover more about Delta, we're discovering more ability for transmissibility. Um, and so that's still, still you know, being uncovered. But the problem is in the pandemic, everyone's had to watch how the sausage is made in, in essence with regards to the scientific process, which usually often really takes place behind the scenes, but it's just so urgent to, to have this, you know, this information. So it's a different scenario. Would it help if the government's actually said, uh, and I know there's a, deba a debate in the States about this, if they just said, look, that we're taking these off the experimental uh, category and we're we're saying they're 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 the real thing. I mean, because there's you hear that argument. I, I mean, it's actually true, in a sense that this is we this is all a big experiment. We won't know what the impact of all this is for, you know, one year, two years, five years. We're still going to be studying this probably forty years later. Yeah, I think the long term impacts of COVID are much much scarier than the long-term impacts of, of the vaccine. Um, it's very unlikely based on the way the vaccine is designed from the medical experts and scientific experts. Yeah. That I've spoken to that, that, that there'll be any significant long-term impacts from vaccination. But of course we've got, you know, the whole long COVID and we've got all sorts of issues around, you know, for, for, for children as well, like about 10% are experiencing symptoms out five weeks out. Uh, from yeah. being infected. So the idea, yeah, the idea of sort of opening up before they've had a chance to at least have their parents choose to, to get vaccinated to me is, is very troubling. Uh, it, it, the problem is, yeah, these these passports are, are a public health measure, but they're sort of being um, framed as an exclusion or just a way to pressure people to get vaccinated. But the, the reality is that's sort of a side effect. And, and the main measure the main reason for the vaccine passports is to be a public health measure. 
but it, it does have that impact. I mean, it's it's if you don't do this, you won't be able to participate in certain activities of society, whether it's going to a concert or a football game or or the, the, the grocery store, whatever it may be. Like, we, we have to have some rules about this. And I don't know, you're, you're the one looking at where health law or the legal system and health issues intersect. How do we do this when we've got provincial and territorial governments and a federal government, and then we're dealing with the international community as well. Like, how do we even get to a place where we have some common ground on this? Well, domestically, there have been legal analyses, uh, at least one important legal analysis done around the uh, the legality of uh, vaccine passports and whether they would likely survive a charter challenge. That was done by Dr. Colleen Flood, a uh, law professor yeah. at the University of Ottawa and her team. And so, they did look at several charter rights uh, and and also, of course, Section 1 of the charter, which, as you know, as a senator, doesn't uh, guarantee all the rights within, especially if there's an important need like public health. Um, right. And so they, they they argued that that this would survive that sort of challenge. And the reason is because it is primarily a public health measure. So when you're looking at the alternatives, right, because unfortunately with Delta transmissibility being just so high, there's going to be a need for, for, for these public health measures. And so uh there's another way of looking at vaccine passports it's sort of a shutdown with an exception for vaccinated individuals which is sort of the reverse way that most people look at it but if the alternative is a shutdown uh you know none of us have the right to go into a property uh, a private property that's a non-essential service when it's shut down due to right. a public health measure so that in a way it's it's no different it's just that we're making an exception uh, for individuals who are vaccinated. So uh, that might be a hard sell. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I'm just thinking if I'm a premier legally. or, <laughs> yeah, legally, yeah. Yeah, I do think legally they're they're highly defensible under Canadian law. And I also think that they're necessary um, for the sort of the reasons I've, I've stated. Uh, we're, we're experiencing exponential growth here in Alberta right now. So, you know, and there's yeah. no, no plan to do this. So... <laughs> Unfortunately, nothing's probably going to happen, uh, and they're going to stop. They're going to stop tracking also cases. So we're just going to have to yeah. watch hospitalizations. Um, so, so yeah. So it, it is a trade-off, but it's, it it requires relative risk analysis, and we need to look at what's the trade-off of not doing this. And um, I do think you know. I guess maybe the reason I was brought into the show, in a sense, the privacy concerns yeah uh, exist, that, but I do think they're over over. Yeah, that's exactly where I want to go, because you do sure. sort of say, look, I think that's overstated and um, and that, you know, and for me, part of this is, I think, a generational thing, too, which is people like you and people that are younger, you're you're used to living on your phones, you're used to exposing your personal information in a way that older generations are not. Um, and it's very hard to figure out how we would share our health information without it being identified uh, and connected to us. And of course, with the geolocation technology that is all on our phone, people already know where we are. So it, there are, I, I think we have to have an answer to it rather than just say, look, your privacy is already compromised every time you go online, so get over it. Right. And I wasn't, my intention when I mentioned that in the article that, you know, we have basically have the complete mechanism for total surveillance already in place. Yeah. It wasn't to, um, it wasn't to, to say that sort of two wrongs make a right. And we'll get to the more detailed privacy arguments in a second. It, um, it was, it was more about just saying, Oh, I've lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you guys so just on the, the privacy, the real privacy aspect of this, which is whether or not, you know, because we have different groups in, in our country, in our society that feel differently about privacy and the exposure of personal information. Younger groups of the population seem more comfortable with it. I, 
I, I sort of agree with that. But if you look at, for example, Facebook usage, I think there's a very high penetration across generations of, uh, yeah. of use of social media. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, all of us, maybe, maybe people believe their privacy is being protected, but then you have Facebook being fi fined $5 billion in 2019 for, from the FTC for, you know, breach of privacy. So yes, hello. Um, <laughs> that's why I also say the article in a way, like we're, most of our privacy has been compromised unintentionally because there's this sort of expectation that you read like a hundred pages of legal documentation when you click yes on your app and no one reasonably does that. Right. So yeah. um, it's unintentional uh, the way that the privacy has been packaged and sold. But yeah, what I was trying to say around the, the two wrongs don't make a right was yeah. um, there's, there's a pressing, pressing need for this. And it can be done in a way that minimizes the use of information. There's a pressing health need to save people's lives. And this, this isn't about, you know, lining the pockets of corporations the way that most privacy breaches are because they're, you know, packaging their data and selling it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I did watch uh, Dr. Kabukian uh, come yeah. on your show uh, and, you know, she made some interesting points. I, I didn't agree with her fully that, this would necessarily result. I felt like she was talking about a lot of worst case scenarios, right? Which I think, yeah. you know, she brought up the the Patriot Act or whatnot in the U.S. and 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 uh, the way that things can sort of spiral. And I th I do think it's it's important to be cognizant of that possibility. But I also think it's very possible to design vaccine passports in a way that uh, sort of address these concerns and and minimize uh, any any concern. And so, but unless get, it's okay, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I can give you an example. Um, if yeah, the government, too. because private, private corporations are already doing this, right? I think Calgary Stampede, the Nashville, uh, the Nashville party or venue or whatnot yeah. already was requiring proof of vaccination to get in. So these systems are starting to be developed privately. And so that's a, one reason why having it centralized through the government, which already owns and controls your health information would be the best way because they already know everything about your health information. Um, so you could design, for example, you an app. You say that with such ease, right? <laughs> they already know it all. So. Yeah, well, under Canadian law, uh, your health records are owned by, you know, clinics and, and, and the government, not by you. And you have the right to access and challenge the accuracy of them. So, yeah, the government certainly knows whether you're vaccinated or not, right? Um, and that's why you received that sheet and they've entered it into the system. So... That, that's a reality that we've been living with for, for a while in terms of the online health record system and sort of different health information laws that, that, that deal with that. So well, they was, would be I, best people to run it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm just going through this myself because I, you know, travel internationally and, and do that. So I've got my health record here in Saskatchewan, but to print that out, it doesn't really... I, I, it doesn't identify me. I have a little piece of paper that says, you know, the little square and that you got a vaccine on such and such a date and that's been entered officially. But if I, it's it's got to identify, if I go to a border, I've got to be able to say, th these are my two vaccines, right? And when right. they happen and how they happen. And right. so it has to be connected to me. And then it has to have some, you know, official stamp of approval. Otherwise, it's just me saying that I've had two vaccines. That's certainly true for international travel. And I do think the privacy concerns are more significant for international travel because you are going to have powerful countries basically, you know, pulling up profiles for everyone in the world about this. So right. that's that to me is a bigger concern than domestically because the domestic ones despite sort of the uh, people's perception of ethical issues with the domestic ones there, it's easier to design it in a way that's sort of internal and, and safer. Um, I'll give you an example. So one thing you bring up that's an important point is we, there are not everyone has a cell phone and it wouldn't be fair for access to, to not have a paper version. So there will need to be a paper version um, available. And so that will be potentially, yeah, that will be identifying there is the possibility in some cases to actually just have a printed QR code, right? You, you've seen these QR codes, so you yep. could actually print one or send one that's printed to individuals, but then you still do require the, you know, the person checking it to have technology. So there's sort of uh, details there to be sorted out, but for the, the vast majority of users, you could have a government app, for example, where you receive the, the you sort of register 
and the information is only going to the government and then it sort of verifies that it's you and then you get your QR code. And then the private company has a government app, again, that doesn't allow them to store any data on their device. They download that, they scan it, and then it just gives a green light or whatever and you go on through. And that, so in that in that example, it's not even 100% certain that you, it, that uh, they're receiving information that you've been vaccinated because you could be part of an exemption group and it doesn't need to specify if it's just a QR code. So very most likely you are. So it could just say vaccinated. you're okay. You're okay to go. That's right. Across yeah. the border. And it, and it may not be that you're vaccinated. It may be that you are in an exempt category. Yeah. And I don't mean sort of to cross borders. This is more for the use of non-essential services that I was talking about, but what it Here. would do is, okay. is take the storage out of, out of the of data, out of the hands of, of, of private corporations. I mean, private corporations are still bound by, you know, privacy law like PIPEDA and then mm -hmm. uh, provincial equivalents, right? So they still are not really allowed to store anything beyond what is needed to serve a purpose, right? There's the basic uh, privacy principle of limiting collection, use, disclosure, and retention. So they ha would have to follow that, but you could set it up so that the government essentially runs the whole thing and no information is going into the storage of private companies. Okay, so let me um, put this dilemma to you that our government and our health officials in this country begged people to take whatever vaccine was available, um, the first and fastest, and, and people went and took AstraZeneca. Um, we knew the Americans would never recognize this vaccine because they were giving it to us because they wouldn't use it. Um, so now we have a whole bunch of people in this country that are vaccinated with AstraZeneca or some kind of mix. So what is our responsibility as a country? If, if we've got these passports going across the border and they can't tell in America whether we've been vaccinated or whether we're in an exempt category, are we somehow legally or morally obligated to say this person is double vaccinated, we're happy with it, but it's with AstraZeneca, which you guys don't recognize. Like, how do we wrestle right. that one? <laughs> and I just read a day ago that AstraZeneca is now applying for approval. So if, because they <laughs> never actually applied because the FDA probably told them behind the scenes, don't bother, we're, we got enough our mRNA, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so now maybe they'll go through that and maybe that'll resolve it if they do approve it. Um, but certainly I don't think the domestic system would necessarily just be able to work internationally. You, you are going to have to prove to uh, the United States or, or other countries that you have received two doses and probably what type as well. And, and yeah, I mean, um, you know, controlling the spread is important for also having the ability to travel internationally. So that's sort of another argument in a way to have good, strong public health measures, right? Um, I think that what's happening in Alberta right now, for example, is likely to impact the willingness of other countries to allow Canadians to travel to them. Well, the, the UK is still not letting us in, even though they used AstraZeneca too, but you know, so we've got a lot of issues. What do you think the time frame on this is? I mean, people uh, on the one hand are ready to, you know, get back out there. Kids are going to school. There's the debate about masking you know, summer is almost coming to an end. People are trying to decide whether they're going to take a winter holiday and go on a cruise. Like, can this possibly be turned around in any reasonable length of time? It depends on outreach, yeah, to get more people vaccinated. Uh, it's it's a very provincial question as well, because Alberta's yeah. been open for a month now. And, our, our and Saskatchewan, are too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, similar, right? But you know, some yeah. provinces have been just slowly starting to work it open now. So uh, it's it, there's going to be waves at different times. The fall worries me a lot. Of course, I live in Alberta, and there are no health measures anymore, and also they're going to stop tracking. So I'm very worried as an Albertan that might not be the same, uh, you know, for yeah. for people in other provinces. It's likely we're going to see a big fourth wave. It's going to not have. Uh, the case to hospitalization and death rate is going to ratio is going to sort of drop, right? There's or or increase, I suppose. Uh, there's going to be a lot more cases, to be clear, than there are hospitalizations relative to previous waves. Right. But when you remove public health measures, Delta is so transmissible that every single person in society is going to get it. That's the problem. So 
you know, you can have a lower, much lower death rate because of vaccination, but then everyone who obviously isn't vaccinated, which for example, in Alberta is 35% of the population doesn't have a mm -hmm. single dose. Then everyone's going to get that. They're going to get sick at, at a very high rate, you know, similar to previous. And then you're going to have some breakthrough in infections. And then, uh, you know, since the, 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 not the high risk groups, there's going to be fewer deaths, but there's going to be a lot of long-term disability and other issues. But as, okay, but as people get ill, then th there is some natural immunity there. So again, we've got, because we don't know how, how Delta will play out for people who need or want to move about in the country, we still have to then resolve this issue of passports or certificates or whatever we want to call it, because that's going to increasingly be an issue for all the reasons that you cite. So if I go to Ottawa to go to the Senate uh, from Saskatchewan, what's going to happen when I land at the airport or when I go to the Senate bit? Like we're going to have to figure out where these certificates are required and people will need them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure that the implementation of domestic vaccine passports would be for travel between provinces. Uh, you know, there has been some restriction. Let's hope of travel. not. But <laughs> yeah, there has been some yeah. restriction of travel between provinces during the pandemic, during states of yeah. emergency. Yeah. Uh, but I don't. Yeah, I don't see that as the main use case. And and so because health information is controlled provincially, ultimately, if there are vaccine passports, they're going to likely be provincially managed or privately managed, which would be the worst yeah. worst option in my opinion. Um, and and so there'll just be different standards in different places. But we're going to have what I guess what my question is, is how quickly can we ramp this up so that people who are who need or want to move and who are vaccinated can go to events? I mean, if if I'm being asked if I want to go to a concert or a store, I, I don't you know, we don't know what it might be. What can I produce? We need an answer. We're being told not you can't have paper documents because that's too easy to fudge or to reproduce and you know borrow somebody else's vaccination document and change it um but then right. the other issue of if you don't have a cell phone with you 24 7 and a qr code then what right yeah you want to have the paper backup so i mean Quebec's already sent out QR codes and they're only they're sort of using them in a targeted manner depending on case rates right that was that's what they're doing uh, Manitoba sent out a proof of vaccination um, the other provinces aren't aren't really doing it I'm not sure if there's any smaller ones that are still doing it or planning to do it so in terms of how it would be implemented it would be done on the provincial level but it's not yeah. going to happen most of the time my argument is just that it's necessary because the alternative is going to be either a lot of people getting sick and and d disabled and some and some dying or the, the full lockdowns again. So to me, this is a much better measure than full lockdowns um, because just the si emerging scientific reality is is just that with Delta and the current rates of vaccination, there there's still public health issues with large gatherings indoors, especially. And what about the view that? We are just, you know, we're, we're not going to eradicate um, COVID or coronaviruses. And that at a certain point, we have to say, you take responsibility for where you go and how you live and who you come in contact with, understanding that this is a possibility in our society, as is the, you know, the flu every fall when you get on a plane or, you know, in close contact with people that somehow we have to shift our thinking about this to it's a fact of life as opposed to it's it's an emergency. Right. I, I do think there will be a time that COVID becomes endemic. Uh -huh. uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's spread so wide now that it's unlikely to be eradicated and uh, unless, right. you know, future vaccines can, can be even more effective. I think that there'll be a need for public health measures. That doesn't necessarily mean full lockdowns or any anything super serious for a couple of years at least, because what it is is sort of a race of the science and the, and, and the vaccination and, and you know, probably new versions of the, of the vaccine that target Delta, et cetera. 
versus the spread. And so the faster, you know, we're, we've got um, something like 4 billion doses worldwide, something close to that uh, out right now. Yeah. And so once we can get, you know, Delta came from India because, you know, it, it was a part of the world that didn't have access to vaccination early. Uh, and so, you know, once the whole world is sort of getting proper vaccination, and then we can get an update that addresses new variants, we can hopefully stop the spread of, uh, of the virus and also prevent new variants, right? Right now, you know, if we, if we just open up, unfortunately, it's still a lot of cooking, sort of cooking a new variant, you could say. That yeah. was a line that uh, that uh, Dr. Obogu at my faculty mentioned recently. So I thought yeah. that was a good one. Well, this is going to be um, a tough issue for governments, whether whatever level to deal with. and. And for all of us as citizens, I guess, to decide what level of uh, exposure risk we're comfortable with, what role of surveillance we're comfortable with, right? This is this is the uh, the battle, and it's up to guys like you, looking at health policy research and whether or not we can make some rules that are legal. We uh, really appreciate your comments on this today. Really helpful. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Senator, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate it. No, it's a good conversation. Blake Murdoch, Senior Research Associate at the University of Alberta's Health Law Institute. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for being with us for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallace.